what we're talking about this morning or afternoon, evening, whatever it is, wherever you may be, is just some general security, security primer, if you will. Spectrum Protect 812 introduced some capabilities relating to TLS. There are some changes to how to secure connections product. In support of that, uh, what this session then will do is kind of introduce some aspects of security and cryptography just to kind of refresh people's memories or provide a little bit of insight into what these things are if, if you haven't otherwise spent a lot of time reading about things like TLS and asymmetric keys. So there's a couple slides in here throughout the presentation or as a result of questions where we may respond to some things that are futures or forward-looking. Just consider that those are just that. They're forward-looking. They're not commitments. This is subject to change. So until announced, it's all kind of speculative. Uh, there's not a lot of that content, and certainly we'll try to call it out, but just be aware of that kind of standard view of the world. The other, there may be some times when we'll talk about performance, you know, impacts of things like cryptography and things like that. While we can generally characterize performance, behaviors, and things like that, that's certainly a topic where, you know, your mileage will vary depending on actual implementation and resources available on a system and workloads and all sorts of goofy things like that. So Spectrum Protect, we're in custody of people's data, right? You know, you're doing backups, you're doing archives into our system to solve those business needs, backups for operational protection, archive or other things for long-term retention to satisfy regulatory goals. Certainly our goal as a product is to be secure by design. The world continues to change. It's not as easy as just saying it changed and that was like a light bulb turning on and it happened once overnight. But I mean, it's been an evolving landscape, right? And it's evolving through government regulations. We've seen Sorbane-Oxley stuff, we've seen HIPAA, the EU GDPR, the data protection regulations that are coming online, I think it's May of next year. The federal government, the NIST regulations, the Appendix J, if you've seen that. Governments, entities, businesses, industries, all that kind of stuff, they're all moving forward and part of their moving forward also includes how do they secure or make secure the stuff that's important to those industries or government. So as it relates to like Spectrum Protect, right, I mean we're an application. We need to secure access to the system. We give you the ability to make sure that data is secure at rest through things like storage pool encryption and that things are appropriately secure while in flight, while being transmitted or moved between systems. You know, security is, isn't a one size or a, a silver bullet kind of thing where there's a single solution and you're done. Typically what you see from a best practices or a mature practices view of the world is security ends up being multiple layers and what you're looking for is the more layers of security you can put between the malicious actor and the asset, the thing that they're going after, the less likely they're going to be able to get to it. The one level you've got the things that Spectrum Protect will deliver itself, like secure communications, like encrypt at rest, things like that. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other layers, those outer layers that still need to be considered and still need to be designed for, such as firewalls, such as custody and control. I mean, there's manual procedural stuff that also comes into play to, hey, make sure that the people that are supposed to have access have access and that people that aren't supposed to have access don't have access. So you're protecting against things like, you know, not only making sure that we get the data right, but making sure that the people that are managing the system are appropriate and that disgruntled employees or whatever can't go in and make a mess of things or compromise things or steal things. And then certainly there's the, the outer, the automated, or the, the intrusion type things where people are dealing with, you know, the worms or the bots or the viruses or the malware. Certainly, say, over the last six to eight months, the ransomware stuff has really come to the forefront of what a lot of people are thinking about and trying to protect against. At a product level, certainly we've had a ton of conversations with people about, hey, I've been doing this backup and I've been moving to disk-based backup and this, that, and the other thing. And, well, that ransomware is really scary stuff. I really want to get back to a pure air gap solution. How do I reinvigorate or reintroduce tape to help satisfy that? Because, I mean, tape is like the gold standard of, of air gap, right? Um, or what alternatives give me equivalent kind of capability? So there's been a lot, a lot of conversations with customers, business partners, things like that over the recent months for that reason. From the product perspective, Spectrum Protect, 
obviously we can't just stand still and let the world continue to change around us and not be aware of or be responsive to um, making sure that we're doing things that are on par and satisfying the requirements of what an application that's in custody of data should provide for securing that data. So what's changing? 812, there's product-wide adoption and exploitation of TLS. So you'll see a lot of stuff. Um, if you haven't looked at 812 yet, or you've got it in a test banner or kicking the tires, or you rolled it out and stuff, you're saying, hey, there's some things that are different here. The biggest thing is mainly the use of TLS for point-to-point -point communications. And by point-to-point, -point, I mean, there's a lot of different layers of communication in Spectrum Protect. There's cases where clients talk to clients. There's cases where servers talk to clients, or clients talk to servers, and then the server-to-server -server piece. So if you look at those three general categories, the client-to-client -client, uh, is used a lot, for instance, in RVE support, our virtual environment stuff. Client-to-server is obviously pretty ubiquitous. That's all over the place. The server-to-server -server stuff like replication, library sharing, all that kind of stuff. And we've also made some changes to how we're storing credentials, just where and some of the cryptography that's being applied to it without going into too many details there. That's the high-level introduction to that anyway. You know, why is that? Well, relating to the prior slide, I mean, obviously the world is changing around us. I mean, ransomware is out there. I mean, the, the original ransomware, the what the WannaCry attack, that kind of stuff, in a pretty short order, folks were seeing not only that that exploit was being done, but that other people on the dark web or through whatever means were taking that ransomware and evolving it for other purposes to attack other vectors, right? So these attacks, especially once there's a successful one, cause permutations very, very quickly. Um, so those skills and the tools that are available to people that don't want to perform attacks against data repositories, against sites, whatever it is, those tools are out there. Not only are they out there, but they're increasing, they're proliferating, all that kind of stuff. What's available on the dark web without, without personally having gone out and uh, looked or anything, just from cursory, what do you read about, and that kind of stuff. There's stuff out there that's not friendly to folks that are just trying to do business and get along without, inter without getting in interfered by this stuff. Other things that have kind of continued to change the landscape is as compute power continues to increase, the availability of compute cycles, virtualization, computer farms, Part of what we'll talk about in cryptography a little bit later on is part of the strength of cryptography isn't that it's forever unbreakable. It's just that it's, in a lot of cases, it's just really, really computationally complex to get to a result. But by having increasing compute power, by being able to use compute farms that are farmed out across hundreds or thousands or more machines, the resources available to do those exploits become more achievable and that kind of stuff. Plus, we talked about the tools are out there through dark web or through whatever proliferation means. Quite frankly, there's a lot of skill in this area, right? The general knowledge for folks that are interested in cryptography, the ability to go out and understand the algorithms, the techniques, and the vulnerabilities around different algorithms and approaches continues to improve, right? You know, before, say, five, six, ten years ago, whatever it is, you know, you might be talking a very small population that had the skill to do that. And in this day and age, I think that that available body of knowledge and the people with that skill has expanded because of just skill around computers and algorithms and that kind of stuff. Those are some of the motivations behind why you've seen some changes in 812, just trying to keep the product current and make sure that we're uh, doing the things necessary to stay relevant and provide the services that are necessary to be a data protection product in this day and age. A little bit about the where's and why for's. Spectrum Protect uses a a toolkit called GS Kit, the thing internally we call the Global Security Kit. Um, so we've got IBM, we, the bigger IBM, has a team of people that create this toolkit and their entire job is to understand cryptography and encryption and key management and all of the weird little nuances of how do you seed an algorithm correctly and how do you implement this algorithm and how do you prove, you know, how do you prove its correctness, how do you optimize its performance. That toolkit then is used by many of the software products within IBM. We use it. It provides us things like our AES and our SHA message digest. Uh, it also has capabilities around TLS, right, for secure communication. You know, if you look at kind of a, an open source or publicly available equivalent to GSKit, 
open SSLs in the same ballpark. It provides the SSL TLS support. Um, if you look at open SSL, there's really kind of two branches to it. One is the communication branch, which is SSL TLS. The other branch is the cryptography stuff. And you know, you can use open SSL for straight encryption, like the different AES encryption strengths and that kind of stuff, and for various digests like SHA and you know, whatever else they implement, that kind of stuff. So open SSL is, is pretty broad spectrum and, and kind of akin or equivalent, if you will, to what GSKit provides, just a different implementation, if you will. Um, and then certainly some of the languages we use for development of the product, depending on which part of the product you're looking at or which, which set of specific tooling. Things like Java have native libraries for doing these types of capabilities, secure communications, cryptography. Fundamentally, we're using some IBM tools for this where that, those tools were not available or where there were native capabilities built into a language, built into a tool set, whatever it is. There may be cases where we were doing that as well. On that forward-looking view of the world, so 812, we delivered some stuff, some security changes, just a recent step, if you will. And it's not the only one that we're considering. The newer federal government, U.S. federal government regulations um, coming out, the NIST stuff, you'll hear reference, and depending on your business or industry, to Appendix J. Obviously, the EU GDPR stuff for essentially data protection and, and really managing privacy, if you will. Those kinds of things we're looking at and evaluating. Are there some changes there that we need to make? Some possibilities would be one would be multi-factor. I mean, I would bet dollars to donuts that everybody on this call has Amazon or some email account or whatever where it's, hey, I need to authorize this device, and you get a code on your smartphone or whatever it is, and you have to go put in that code in addition to having a password. And that's all the multi-factor is. It's really moving to, in addition to one authorization form or authentication form, such as a password, give me a second one. Kind of the, the big picture view of how multi-factor works is there's different factor types. One is what you know, and typically passwords fall in the camp of what you know. The other is something you possess, and those authorization codes sent to your phone fall in the realm of the what you possess because if I have a phone in my physical possession, you give me a code, and by virtue of you transmitting that code to the thing I'm in possession of, I can close the loop and use that as, as a certification or authentication vehicle, right? Um, there's a third level that comes into play in the pure multi-factor view of the world, and that's biometrics. By and large, we, we don't see that we would be playing in biometrics anytime soon. So we think it's either the what you know or what you possess view of multi-factor as we move forward on that. Um, biometrics are things like fingerprints and retina scans. There are some industries, certainly some government stuff, where that is an important consideration for access to things. But that's not something we're hearing strong requirements for, at least at a product set for us. Pseudonymization um, is probably a long shot. Uh, we're not sure that we have, well, our view on it at this point is EU GDPR comes up with this thing called pseudonymization, which is basically saying takes, take the information about people's data and make it so that it's not usable for somebody to compromise it or attack it at a high level. And I'm sure there's probably some folks that might have a different view of that or a more detailed explanation, but for this audience, this, I think that will suffice. Um, as a data protection product, we don't think that we need to be in that business. Where we've seen pseudonymization done is usually like if there's a, a data warehouse or something that's being extracted for other purposes, that at the point of that extract from the database, that that's where that would occur. And there's, for instance, tools available to databases to accomplish that. So we think we would just be the downstream receiver of whatever that data is. If it's in native form, then whoever's got the ownership of that database is making that decision versus if they need to transform it. So we've looked at it. I'm not sure the pseudonymization is going to be real high on our list, or we'd need to see kind of the market change a little bit on their interpretation of stuff before I think we went down that route. Client-managed encryption. This gets into, and it may be applicable to certainly some folks on this particular call, we've had requirements for changing the way we manage encryption more to be at like a tenant level, so that if I have a bunch of people from the same department or the same company, let that tenant be in custody of some sort of master key that allows encryption of all of their data before it comes into our system at a high level. That's kind of the view of it. We would kind of as a future, we think that we'll 
need to go make some changes to the way we're doing the encryption so it's not on a per client basis but kind of expanded out to be kind of more tenant based or uh, organization so moving off the kind of general preamble stuff let's talk a little bit more about 812 and some specifics there if you look at the top part of this graphic what do we have today well I mean we've had TLS slash SSL for a while now a number of years a number of releases um, fundamentally the way it worked is people may needed to make a decision in how they configure the product to say this client's going to be configured for TLS or this client's going to not be configured for it. And if they're configured for it, you'd have to go through the setup of it and have the server listening on a secure port. Um, so that way all your traffic went over TLS if it was configured for that. And if it wasn't, then all your traffic went over just native TCP IP. What is that? At that point, all the traffic is going over whatever the configured communication channel is. That's your authentication, that's the transfer of all the metadata stuff. Hey, this is a backup object for file XYZ and the data for that file itself. You know, in practice, we haven't seen real widespread use of TLS. Um, we've seen it in pockets here and there with some particular customers. Some of the feedback we get in terms of, well, why folks haven't done it is, well, some are within the confines of their enterprise, within the, the sandbox, if you will, of firewalls and other stuff, and they don't think that they need to go to that level of internal security on their, their own private networks or whatever it is. Um, others have gone down the road saying, well, I mean, hey, this is expensive stuff. The cryptography, the, the stuff to make this, that communication secure um, has a price to be paid, which is CPU and memory, and it can slow things down. And for that reason, some people have opted to steer clear of it. What you see in 812 is kind of what we're referring to as a, a hybrid TLS. You know, we'll basically use a single communication between the client and server. Uh, we'll do the initial bootstrap of the session through TLS, get a secure connection, do our authentication, um, and that kind of stuff. And then there's some decisions we'll make that says, well, if, if they're running in hybrid mode, we'll let the metadata, the description information about the files and that kind of stuff stay encrypted in the TLS part of the channel. And we'll let the data go over the unencrypted channel or the unencrypted part of the communication channel, if you will, just to try to optimize for the performance of that data transfer. The decision there is, well, if I want every bit of my traffic, including my data encrypted, you can do that. And there's just some settings you need to do to make that happen. By doing this hybrid mode, though, we kind of mitigate the CPU costs of doing the cryptography and stuff. So that way, by keeping it just to the parts of the protocol and the, the exchanges that need or best benefit from the encryption, um, by keeping it to a smaller part of the overall traffic, uh, we mitigate the effects and kind of keep the, the throughput and the time for the operations pretty close to or on par with what you're getting without TLS. That's a good thing. A lot of work went into that. Certainly. As you look at 812, if you've already looked at it, hopefully one of the things you've discovered is this thing called session security. This is an attribute on client nodes. This is an attribute on administrators. And it's really setting um, a preference in terms of how we're going to allow things to connect in. Today, prior to 812, uh, basically a client can be configured to use TLS one day. The next day they can switch, turn off the TLS stuff, and come in on straight TCP IP, you know, non-TLS, non-encrypted, all that kind of stuff. And we'll let you toggle back and forth just fine, right? It's kind of like it's your settings, change them how you want. With the session security stuff, though, what ends up happening is we really kind of preference um, once we see that you've gone to a secure posture, uh, such as using TLS, we're going to really preference that you keep using TLS because it's it's a good way to go, right? It's for the reasons we talked about earlier, our motivations before, using TLS is beneficial to, to everybody uh, to keep data secure and to keep it encrypted and that kind of stuff. The session security has this notion of transitional and strict. Transitional is just that. When you initially roll out 812, whatever it is, and you're using clients that aren't at this newer level of support, they'll be allowed to connect in and keep doing things the way they've been doing it. Arguably, it'll be over straight TCP IP and, and through whatever means that they're doing uh, their data transfers and everything else. Um, however, once you get to 812 and you have a client that moves from a prior client version up to a client level, an 812 client level or higher, that knows how to do this new TLS and that hybrid TLS mode stuff that we just talked about, they'll start doing that and they'll preference that. So once we get to that point, um, 
you know, we'll basically look for that, we record that, we manage to that. Um, and once we see that a client is 812 or higher, we're not going to let you go with a, hey, I need a version 7 client and fall back to that. If he tries to connect in and you know, that client's already been promoted up to strictness, um, you're going to have to make some decisions about opening that back up and allowing that back-level client to access that data again. Part of the reason for that is once we know that client Fred got up to an 812 or higher level client and is working in a secure manner in terms of how they're doing their data exchanges and, and negotiation, we don't want somebody to come in like a malicious Fred trying to do an attack on the system um, on an insecure channel, we don't want them to have an avenue in to try to get access or formulate some sort of attack against the system. So anyway, um, as it relates to 812, certainly take a look at the session security settings. Um, those are really foundational to one of the big, you know, to the big changes that have happened in 812. And, you know, understanding that, taking that into account as you're rolling this out, as you're deploying, is going to be pretty important. Kind of an analogy to the strictness is kind of, and you know, it's a horrible picture, um, but I mean, it's like everybody here is driving around cars. Certainly, for folks, you can think back to say, okay, I, I remember personally, right, when hey, airbags were optional, and it was a big deal to get a car with an airbag because I mean, it was extra money and you had to get options and blah blah blah. And then it moved from airbags being optional to well, frontal airbags are standard, and then the side ones are the optional ones. Well, okay, now airbags are common and, and default everywhere. And then you were doing things like, hey, well, anti-lock brakes are option. Well, now it's pretty much ubiquitous. Everybody's got that. And stability crawl, control, and crumple zones and, zones and all that kind of stuff. So it's just one of those things that if you look at, you know, if you look at cars as an analogy, I don't know that there's anybody here, by and large, that's going to say, I'm going to load up the family and go drive cross country, but I don't want to do it in a car that's got all the safety stuff in it, right? Or I don't want to be driving back and forth and dropping my kid off at school in a car that doesn't have appropriate safety measures so that if I get hit by some unattended driver or unattentive driver that, that I don't have the best amount of protection for me and my family or me or the people that are important to me, right? The view on session security and the promotion from transitional to strictness is kind of the same thing. At the point that folks get to a position that is known to be secure or known to be more safe than the others, we're just making it explicit that will do that promotion. And if you don't want that to occur, you need to f make specific decisions to opt out or allow those back-level clients to continue to connect or things like that. So that's kind of the, ana the analogy. Um, hopefully you like it, and if not, well, I'll try for a better one next time. As it relates then to this TLS stuff, we already talked a little bit about, well, it's changing. We've got the session security stuff. Well, where is it that I'm actually going to use this? Well, I kind of alluded to some of this before. We've got a number of different kinds of communication, point-to-point -point communication in a product, um, client-to-client, server-server, client-to-server, all that kind of stuff. In actuality, TLS has got a couple different capabilities. One is, and, and you might hear this through different terms, I'm just going to refer to it as like two-way or mutual certificate authentication. In that case, both parts of the communication, you know, the, the guy that's originating the communication and the, the person that they're talking to, both sides end up creating their own private certificate. And from that private credential, they generate a public certificate and have to exchange that to both, to both parties. So what mutual authentication does, it says that each side has their own private credential and each side has the public certificate from the other guy. And then as part of the TLS initialization, as, as part of the configuration of that TLS session, both sides need to exchange the public certificate and validate it against the private credentials and make sure that each one is talking to who they expect. So that mutual authentication, and certainly if, if you read about TLS, there's probably more elegant and much better descriptions of that. The example here just shows Entity A has a private certificate, a common name A. Entity B has a private common name B. Entity B has the public certificate for A. Entity A has the public certificate for B. That's the set of information that's going to get exchanged and negotiated. And if things pass muster, then A will be able to talk to B, and B will allow a connection from A. That type of authentication based on TLS and certificates on both sides is used in our client-to-client -client communications and our server-to-server. The other 
part of TLS is kind of just a server-side authentication. That's where I've got an entity, a client in this case, that's got the public certificate for the server he's trying to talk to, and that server has a you know its private credential and had issued a public certificate for itself. That client uses its knowledge of that public certificate and exchanges from that server target to make sure he's talking to the point, you know, that endpoint that he's intending to reach out to. So that kind of the a one-way or a server-side authentication is done for our client server communications. So at a high level, that's kind of where and how you're seeing TLS get rolled out. Why as you roll out 812, you're having to make decisions or understand some things about client to client and server to server um, that maybe you didn't have to deal with before and things like that. So at a high level, that's kind of some of the, the key stuff as it relates to what is it and how did it play out in terms of some of the changes. The big picture view of the changes in 812, certainly there's other sessions, there's other materials available that kind of go into greater detail on what was delivered in 812 and so on. Changing gears, we're going to dive into a little bit more about cryptography just so that if you haven't had the, the privilege of diving into some of these topics um, that we can kind of, as it relates to understanding why is TLS, why are certificates, why is some of the stuff important, what are some of the key concepts around how this stuff works. What you'll find is within Spectrum Protect, we're really dealing with a couple different kinds of things. One of which is just basic encryption. The TLS communication uses encryption. Uh, certainly as we're doing encryption of data at rest, that's using encryption such as AES and things like that. Generally speaking, encryption is symmetric. And what does symmetric mean? It means that I can encrypt a piece of data and then I can do a reverse of that encryption to decrypt it and get back to the original result. So it's symmetric in the sense that I can go from unencrypted data to encrypted and then I can reverse the encryption process and get back to the original result. Encryption, you'll hear a term called SALT. And what SALT does is it's really how do you initialize the algorithms and an important aspect of the way these algorithms work is they need a truly random number, which is what gives them strength against an attack. Because if somebody initializes an algorithm with the same value each time, uh, it's easier to discover what that is and for somebody to maliciously decrypt data that they may not otherwise have access to. So encryption things that do encryption things like DES and AES and I mean even TLS, and we'll get more into that here in a moment. The key. Uh, is another term that you'll use, and that's just in addition to that random number, there's a key that gets used. So the combination of the key plus the salt is, is how you basically seed or initialize an encryption algorithm to be able to take the transform data, encrypt it, and then use the key and knowledge of the salt to decrypt it. One other thing that you'll see is a thing called CBC, stands for Cypher Blockchaining. That's just down, way down in the bowels of the way cryptography works. Basically what it's saying is that I'm going to use the salt and the key to encrypt block one. I then use that encryption result for block one as part of how I then encrypt the second block of data. Um, and then I use that second block of data to help encrypt the third block of data and so on. So the, you know, the cipher blockchaining is almost like it's a cascading thing. Once I encrypt that initial block, things start propagating through subsequent blocks where a further out block is dependent on a prior block's encryption result. Um, and that type of technique also helps to promote the strength of the cryptography in use. Because if I simply encrypt it with a salt and a key and everything's done the same way uniformly, that's an easier thing to attack from a, a malicious actor's perspective as opposed to the cipher blockchaining, which makes each subsequent block becomes, you know, kind of harder or at least has a certain degree of randomness that needs to be applied in order to um, compromise it or get to it. <laughs> Still in the realm of cryptography, what we just talked about is encryption. And encryption, you know, you're talking about symmetric algorithms, the ability to encrypt and decrypt, things like that. The other thing that's used is this notion of a hash. And hash is kind of short form for secure hashing algorithm. The difference between a hash and encryption is hashes tend to be one way. They're good for testing the validity of data, and they're good for encoding a result that cannot be reversed. So it's not symmetric the way encryption is. Because with encryption, I can encrypt it, and then I can decrypt it. That gives me the symmetry. Hashing, 
I take a value, I hash it, and it's really one way. Once I have a hashed value, if the, hash, if the hashing algorithm or digest is strong, I'll get a truly good, strong, unique value. But once I have that value, I can't reverse that and get back to the original, right? So hashes tend to be really good for data identification. They're used, for example, we use them for deduplication, um, things like that. Uh, but it's not good for things like encryption, because like if I need to encrypt it and I want to get the data back, turning it into a hash doesn't give me a way to get it back. I don't have that decryption symmetry capability. Here I call out, well, is it impossible to reverse the result and to determine the original value? No. Um, whether it's a hash, whether it's encryption, these things, like I said before, it's not about the impossibility of being able to do it. It's about the computational complexity of being able to do it. Because when you start talking about these really strong algorithms, and by strong, you're talking about the strength of the, the key length, like is it 256 bits versus something short or whatever it is, the longer those key lengths, the more computationally complex. And you're talking some of these things might be on the order of months or years or tens of years of computational time in order to reverse it and get to a known reversible outcome. If you all have seen, I think it was Google, probably in the earlier part of the year, had basically done a proof working with the university on the ability to crack a SHA digest. I think it was a SHA-1 digest. And yeah, so there was a theoretical exploit that they said, hey, SHA-1s are vulnerable for this reason. And if we throw enough computing power at it, we can take a SHA-1 and actually get back to the original data or manipulate a SHA-1 so that I can have two pieces of data that result in the same SHA value, which is ultimately what they proved. So they went and did that. They proved that it's possible. The interesting thing is, and if you look at the, their write-up on that, they were talking about like, like a thousand years worth of computational power. So they had this compute farm that Google had access to or through the Google infrastructure. And if you look at the, the amount of computations that they had to perform in order to do that exploit, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was gigantic. While there are theoretical exploits that can compromise some of these things, the folks with the skill and the resource to be able to exploit them is few and far between. That's why what's secure today may not be secure tomorrow, and that's why you see algorithms continue to change. Like a SHA-1 that was good five years ago, 10 years ago, may not be good today or tomorrow, and you need to go to the SHA-256s. But the SHA-256s, say, five years from now may be in the same boat, right? So things keep moving just based on how technology, how resources, and all that kind of stuff continue to evolve. One other concept you'll hear is this notion of public key cryptography. Uh, and really what you're talking about here is asymmetric. And the place where you see this is, how does a source and target, you know, like a client talk to a server over an insecure network? Because if I just, am I on the internet and I'm connecting to a point, a server, whatever it is, how do I know that I'm talking to it? How could I exchange some information between the two parties to establish authentication to establish trust. Typically what you see is a public key cryptography or an asymmetric, there's terms like PAKE or things like that. It's asymmetric key en encryption, things like that. At a high level what this is, is it relies on encryption. Um, there's two keys. There's one that the connect from the source has. There's one that the target has. Those two keys are mathematically related. Um, or the tokens that get generated based on those passwords are based on algorithms that are mathematically related. Um, key one is used to encrypt, presumably the source that gets sent over to the target. The target then uses its knowledge of the algorithm, the mathematical properties that are in use. It uses that to decrypt it, and then they do a comparison to say, hey, you know, do you have, did you give me the right password or whatever it is, right? Generally what you see is there's two types um, of algorithms used for this. Uh, one, the type one, which is probably the most common, or had been the most common, relies on natural, quote unquote, prime numbers and modulo arithmetic. Um, for these to be effective and to be appropriately strong so that the data that's being exchanged is computationally difficult to crack on the fly, the prime numbers that we're talking about are gigantic, right? So, I mean, if you go start reading about this, there's entire people's careers that they're just looking for faster, more effective ways to generate crazy big prime numbers, A, so that they can get appropriate strength, and B, so that they can do the proofs around that prime number to prove that it's really prime. Because once you get 
really, really large prime numbers, one of the pitfalls that you fall into is how do I know it's a prime, that it's only divisible by itself or whatever the definition is, right? So, I mean, there's a ton of intellectual property and thought from mathematicians and algorithmic people that go into how do you generate these kind of values in an appropriate way. The other type of algorithms that we're seeing used in this case is a thing called an elliptic curve. So that's basically saying I have a curve and I'm looking at points on the curve and I'm using the relationship of two points on the curve and an algorithm that describes those two points on the curve in order to establish the strength of the algorithm. Um, these are nice because computationally they're faster than the prime number ones because you're not having to generate these crazy big prime numbers and stuff like that. So they've come into favor and are kind of probably the state of the art in most cases today. If you see algorithms with an EC designation, that stands for elliptic curve, so it's one of these class of algorithms. So these are computationally strong. Uh, you can get equivalent or better bit strength of an algorithm for fewer bits because of the algorithm differences here. Uh, the only weirdness there is there's at least, as it relates to elliptic curves, for certain classes of them, there's at least a theoretical exploit that says with quantum computing, an elliptic curve that can be cracked with, you know, 10 years of computation using traditional computers can be cracked with a couple qubits of quantum computing power, right? Because quantum computing approaches the problem considerably differently and has various powers, computational powers, if you will, that get to an end result faster. Those are still theoretical. All the people have done is say, well, I think I could get there with a quantum computer, but nobody's actually proven that yet. Reasonably, I would expect at some point quantum computing, at least for some class of elliptic curve algorithms, is going to prove an exploit, and either the elliptic curve algorithms will be adjusted to mitigate or fight against that attack, or we'll move to a world where we're using quantum computing to do this cryptography stuff and to generate or seed these values. So again, the world's changing as technology and everything else moves forward. So a little bit more on the brick and mortar stuff. Again, just adding context to as folks are having to deal with a TLS-based security model, understanding some of the concepts. We just talked about encryption and digests and asymmetric keys. Well, what does all that stuff mean as it relates to TLS? Well. What that means is when you're looking at TLS ciphers, you can see that a given implementation supports certain ciphers. And on the left, you'll see this is a list of ciphers. I think this one was from Open, OpenSSL. Arguably, you would be able to see this through some other means as well, like our GSKIT library has equivalent to this. Java has things like that, those kinds of things. At the point that you see a cipher list like that, how do you understand what that cipher list is? Well, TLS, OK, so it's the, the modern current standard TLS stuff. The second stanza for the cipher is the key exchange algorithm, which is how to authenticate a connection, right? So here it's ECDHE, so it's an elliptic curve. DH is Diffie-Hellman. I forget what the E stands for. And then RSA is, is another uh, authentication type. So that first stanza then is how am I going to do authentication between the two parties to establish trust? By looking at the ciphers, you can see hey, some of them are EC for elliptic curve. The ones that don't have EC are using the more traditional prime number modular arithmetic. DH is Diffie-Hellman. RSA is three guys' initials from that came up with whatever that algorithm is. And I forget their names, but you get the idea. The next stanza, the with AES-128 GCM um, in this example, that's the bulk encryption algorithm. So at the point that they've established trust, authenticated, and allow connection from point to point, then they're going to encrypt the traffic between the two parties, and they're going to use that algorithm that's specified in Cypher for doing that encryption. So in this case, it's 128-bit AC, AES. GCM, that's an acronym. You'd have to look it up. I can't even say it if I'm looking at it. It's uh, The key thing is GCM is tamper detection. A GCM-based algorithm says that when I decrypt it, as part of decrypting it, I can detect whether or not there's been any manipulations of it, sort of like a checksum or a digest. Right. So the GCM-based algorithms for encryption um, are kind of preferred because in addition to doing the encryption, you get tamper detection, which is a nice thing. The final thing is the digest that's used. So while some encryption algorithms that use GCM have tamper detection, 
Um, if I'm not using a GCM variant of the encryption algorithm, it doesn't have to tamper detection. I can decrypt it, and I'll get what I get. If bits have gotten flipped, I won't know that. The digest part allows me to detect whether things have been eliminated, you know, whether I've had bit manipulations in there. So the digest just says, for this block of data, I'm going to use this digest. And as part of transmitting this block of data, I'm going to also give you a digest so that you can run the digest check on your side and make sure that the digests match, right? So that's what the ciphers are. It's really, you know, the two points are going to negotiate, hey, I have, I know these ciphers, you know those ciphers. Let's meet in the middle and figure out what ciphers overlap between us and then figure out the best cipher we can use um, based on things like prefer the elliptic curves versus the non, prefer the GCM encryption algorithms versus the non, things like that. That's it. That's the cool part about these ciphers is that stuff we just talked about, encryption, digests, um, asymmetric key exchanges, that kind of stuff. You all don't have to worry so much about that. That's incumbent or built into the way TLS works on our behalf. And it's really just a matter of understanding that those are the building blocks that TLS uses. And these TLS ciphers then are what exploit those or actually do those, perform those actions kind of from a concept level that uh, some people struggle with sometimes is if we look at the communication from a source to a target, it's all TCP IP, right? At the point that we do TLS, it's almost like you're doing a VPN or a layer of security on top of that existing TCP IP channel because this traffic is still flowing over TCP IP. It's just that in a TLS case, it's authenticated the two points of the connection establish trust between those two points of the connection based on the authentication stuff in the cipher we just talked about. And then once it gets past that authentication step and decides, yeah, I can trust this person I'm talking to, then it uses the encryption and the digest in order to flow traffic back and forth in a secure, predictable way. And as part of that predictability, it can be decrypted, it can detect tamper, it has the digest to make sure that bits aren't dropped along the way. So the TLS stuff is really a security capability on top of base TCP IP that gives you those, you know, those security behaviors or security aspects. So that's it. That's kind of the, hey, what is the stuff that 812 delivered? Why do I care? Well, why do you care? Because it's making you secure and it's important in this day and age, not just today, but I mean, going forward, that's a little bit about what are some of the key concepts and, and things in terms of understanding why using TLS actually benefits you and solves some of those security problems in terms of how does this protect me from a malicious actor? How does this improve my security posture? Well, it's doing so because it's vetting or, or making sure that your point-to-point -point connections are trusted. It's making sure that the encryption is done in, a, in an appropriate manner and that the traffic is encrypted and that it can detect whether or not there's been any kind of tampering on the line and things like that. At the end, what are some inf information sources that I personally have used that have actually been pretty good? The OpenSSL website has got a plethora of data. It's certainly a little bit more implementation specific in terms of how do you implement TLS versus, you know, AES encryption, this and that. Um, but there's nuggets of why things work the way they do and how to do things appropriately there. Um, so it's a little bit more implementation specific. The book that's referenced here is just a book that I found. It's available on Amazon and other stuff. Certainly, there's a gazillion books on TLS and security. And this is not meant to say that this is the gold standard and the only one to be considered. This one was good kind of from a developer's perspective because it takes you through the concepts, but it takes you from uh, how do you implement these things? How do you do a DES cryptography algorithm? How do you implement an RSA key exchange for authentication, right? So in addition to showing you how to implement the piece's parts, it explained you know, not only the implementation, but then the rationale for it. So from a developer's point of view, it, it provides insight in terms of what's going on under the covers, in terms of what these things mean. For a lot of folks on this call, that may not be terribly interesting. It's still a good book in that regard, because you can read the concept stuff and kind of skip the, here's how to implement the code parts of it. It was a useful, useful book from my perspective. Um, certainly, like I said, there are gazillions of books on security and TLS and everything else out there. Um, and these are just two that I personally found to be kind of interesting or useful, at least from my understanding of some of this stuff.